the first session was very, very popular. We have a very high bar for the second session. I think you'll agree that the topics are very interesting and very important to all of you who have PSC or uh, have a family member with PSC. Um, and I'm very uh, glad to begin. My job is to moderate, and uh, really what that means to me is that I'm going to keep the speakers on time. Um, I will go off to the side while they're speaking, but if they see me approaching the lectern, it means that their time is up and they are soon to get the hook, okay? So that's my job. And we'll do the questions and answers just as we did in the first session. So it gives me a great deal of uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Piero, who is a member of our Department of Rheumatology and Immunologic Diseases. Um, there's nothing uh, perhaps outside the liver or the bile duct that is more important to the long-term health of those with cholestatic liver disease, such as PSC, than bone health. And she's going to talk to you about how to maintain it. Uh, why it becomes uh, the disordered and uh, the best management strategies. Dr. Piero. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have no disclosures. So my objectives today are to talk just briefly about normal bone, um, what is osteoporosis, risk factors for osteoporosis, why are we talking about this? Because there are increased bone metabolic disorders in PSC, specifically osteoporosis and osteopenia, which you can think of as osteoporosis light, and um, how is osteoporosis diagnosed and what can be done about it? So a couple just basic um, principles in terms of what bone is like. There are really two types of bone in the body. The spongy type of bone you would see if you looked at a vertebra, and that is known as trabecular bone, and the more compact bone or cortical bone that is thicker and um, more solid. And different bones in the body have different compositions. So the vertebral bones are primarily that spongy trabecular type of bone, whereas the long bones are the thicker cortical type bone. And these different bones um, fulfill different functions and are also more or less susceptible to different medications and different diseases. And in osteoporosis and in PSC in general, it is the vertebral spongy type of bone that is most at risk. And why are we talking about all of this? Well, because obviously Increased bone fragility leads to fractures, and we are trying to avoid this. These are not painful conditions. In fact, they're painless unless and until you get a fracture, and then they definitely become painful. Those, this is what we want to prevent. So osteoporosis is a skeletal disorder that's characterized by compromised bone strength. And you can see in the pictures here, these are photomicrographs of normal bone on the left that has, whoops, let's go back normal bone on the left that has that very solid structure compared to osteoporotic bone on the right, which is much thinner, which are, in which there is more air than bone. And the pink pictures underneath just show the same thing at a microscopic level, where the pink, the pink stuff is the bone, and you can appreciate that on the right, in osteoporotic bone, there is much, much less bone. And so the bone is there, but it is thinner and more fragile and hence more susceptible to fracture. I, I'm not showing you pictures of hip fractures because I think everybody has a sense of what hip fractures do, and hip fractures are not silent, and we know when they're hip fractures, but vertebral fractures can be much more subtle to pick up. And where do osteoporotic fractures occur? This, these are just percentages from one study that outline where uh, fractures occur. And vertebral fractures are actually much more common than one would think. Um, these pictures that you're seeing are pictures of the vertebrae, so these, these are x-rays of the spine, and you're seeing the x-ray from uh, the front to the back, and it may not be entirely obvious, but if you look at this next picture where I have identified levels, these are levels where there are osteoporotic fractures of the vertebrae. And if you look closely at the vertebrae that are identified this way, you'll notice that instead of being nice and square, they're a little bit wedge-shaped, kind of like a, a pizza, if you will. The wedge can be subtle, but it can be very prominent, as in, on, for example, on the uh, right-hand side at T12, that is a very prominent vertebral compression fracture. And these fractures are generally painful, but sometimes they're painless. So um, it, I can't tell you how many times I have seen, I go look at the chest x-ray, because that's where I typically see the, the
Nope. Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, I can't tell you how often I've seen um, silent vertebral fractures on, uh, on uh, lateral views of the chest x-ray. Um, now, I have had patients who have told me these are the most painful thing imaginable, and I have other patients who tell me they don't feel a thing. Um, a bad vertebral compression fracture, I had one patient explain in very uh, great detail to me, felt like somebody took their hand, their knuckle, and pushed, push, 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 nonstop on the back. And that's what it felt like. They don't all feel that way, but they can. And so these are can be painful, but they can also have significant consequences in terms of just the position of the spine. With enough vertebral compression fractures, the spine becomes hunched over, and not only does it lead to kind of that unsightly rounded back, but this actually has physiologic consequences. When there is hunching over like this, the the thorax can't expand anymore, and there's less breathing capacity. So there, number one, there's um, decreased breathing capacity. It also affects how one carries oneself, which in terms decreases range of motion, and it's harder to kind of turn around and look, um, which contributes to uh, falls. And in addition, with decrease in um, decrease in, in ability to expand the, the trunk, the, the diaphragm has to take a bigger role in breathing. And so what happens is patients who have the hunched over back from vertebral compression fractures will typically have the diaphragm rising higher in the abdomen, which leads to that poofy belly that never is going to go away because you're relying so much on your diaphragm for breathing because the extra thoracic muscles aren't, doing their, aren't able to do their job. So there are a lot of consequences down the road for, um, for this. I love that they just took my, the picture as I'm looking like a... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Okay. So what... <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, so when do we... Uh, what, what type of fractures are we looking at for osteoporotic fractures? Um, Osteoporotic fractures, by definition, any of the fractures that are listed here, and the big ones are vertebra and hip, are, could put, put, put a patient at risk for what are called fragility fractures. Fragility fractures are any fracture that occurs from a standing height or less without major trauma. The classic being so you slip on the ice and fall and break something. That is a fragility fracture if it's from standing height. Now, if you were on a step stool and three, and you know, a foot up, who knows if it really qualifies? If you fell from a tree or from a gutter, that's a different matter. If there was trauma and if there was a motor vehicle accident or, or fast, uh, fast speed involved, who knows? But the point being, if you are an adult, this is true whether or not you have PSC. If you are an adult and you have had a fragility fracture, you fractured something just from a standing height, you have osteoporosis because that was basically a stress test for your bones. Okay. And that is one of the definitions of osteoporosis. The other definition I will go into has to do with what the numbers look like on bone density. Why is this important? Because there can be a very high risk of mortality as well from osteoporotic fractures. This is mostly true for hip fractures, but I think we've all known somebody in our family or an acquaintance who after a hip fracture, things just went downhill and did not go well after that. So we want to try to avoid this. What happens with osteoporosis? So this is one of the few instances where there's a lot more information on women than men. This is unusual in the world of medicine, but this is true here. Um, women beginning at age 40 will start losing bone mass, and that graph indicates when bone mass peaks. So your bone mass peaks, if you are a 20 or 30 year old, you still have a chance of putting on some bone mass, but after that, you're just coasting along on what you have. Um, so women beginning at age 40 will lose about half a percent per year, then one to two percent. At the time of menopause, it really dramatically increases to two to five percent. And men, much less. Men start off with a bigger bone mass, and they just slowly coast along, and there is no menopause where it just drops. It, it just slowly drifts down over time. And men just have a lower rate of bone loss. Um, for comparison, if there is immobilization, such as spinal cord injury or other reasons to be in bed basically not moving, there's a much rap more rapid rate of bone loss. And look what happens if you go orbit in space. That's one and a half per month, okay, which is a huge, huge uh, amount of bone loss. 
Now, what happens with PBC? PBC is in and of itself a, a, an increased risk for osteoporosis. And women with PBC basically have the same rate of bone loss even early on as perimenopausal women, which is one of the big risk factors of bone loss. So it's very important to understand that the illness itself will cause, um, I'm sorry, I meant PSC, I apologize. Um, PSC, it's been shown for, I take that back. No, unfortunately, as I'm sure you've seen, many of the, many of the uh, studies sometimes do PSC and sometimes do PBC. So this one I, I did verify is PBC. Um, there have not been actual studies for PSC, but we extrapolate that it is likely the case. I apologize for getting those mixed up. It's because I kept having to look, look it up. Um, risk factors for osteoporosis. So the big one is age. And the next one is estrogen deficiency. But really, any chronic inflammatory bowel di inflammatory disease in general, including inflammatory bowel disease, um, PSC, rheumatoid arthritis, um, psoriatic arthritis, all these chronic inflammatory conditions will are, are risk factors for osteoporosis. And I will go through some of these other ones as well. So we do know that there is an increased uh, prevalence of osteoporosis in these are specific, specifically PSC patients. In 237 patients followed over 10 years, 15% had osteoporosis, 41% had osteopenia, which, as I said, is kind of osteoporosis light. And the risk increased with age, low body mass index, meaning low weight, and concomitant chronic inflammatory bowel disease, such that patients who have all three Three quarters of these patients had osteoporosis. So if you have low body weight, higher in age, and concurrent Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, there is a high risk of osteoporosis. So I mentioned how the diagnosis can sometimes be made as well is through a bone density test. And this is uh, a test that is done that is a very simple test, takes maybe 15 minutes, that actually measures the calcium content of bone. Now remember, any history of hip or vertebral fracture, or any fracture really, um, from a standing height in adulthood, in and of itself establishes a diagnosis of osteoporosis, and certainly should prompt uh, measurement of bone density. So when we get bone density tests, we will get a result that looks something like this, and in the end, there is a measurement that is obtained called the T-score, which I will explain in just a little bit. And so what the machine does is actually look at how much calcium content is in the hip as a representative of cortical bone and the spine as a representative of trabecular bone. And the numbers are graded on what is called a T-score. So what is a T-score? A T-score is a concept of distribution of normal values that we use in describing bone density. So what you're seeing here is a typical bell-shaped curve, which is also called a normal distribution. In other words, if you were to measure the bone density on 1,000 patients, you would have the, the numbers would kind of fall into this bell-shaped curve, where out to the right would be patients with very strong bone, out to the left, patients with very weak bone. The average person in the middle would have, most people would be clustered in the middle, and that would be given a T-score of zero. By definition, the mean, the median, uh, the mean, I'm sorry, the average score, um, where most people cluster is a T-score of zero. The further you go out to the right, the stronger the bone. The further to the left, the weaker the bone. If you go out to the right and have strong bone, the T-score is plus one, better bone, plus two, really great bone, plus three, and the reverse is true on the left. By definition, these scores of one, two, and three uh, correspond to uh, two-thirds or 95%. So if you are at negative two, that means everything to the left of negative two is the lowest two and a half percent, and to the right of plus two is the highest two and a half percent. So between negative two and plus two, 95% of the, of the population will be clustered. So this is what we use to then establish a diagnosis of osteoporosis. If the score, the T-score, is negative 2.5 or lower, in other words, you are in the less, in the lowest two and a half percent of uh, T scores. That, by definition, is considered to be osteoporosis. If the number falls between negative one and negative two point five, that is osteopenia. That's why I was saying it's kind of like osteoporosis light. The numbers are there, but they're not quite as bad. 
So again, far to the left, osteoporosis, and I have seen patients with T-scores of negative five. I mean, it can happen. That's really, really bad, but it can happen. Um, that would be somebody, say a woman who had her ovaries removed at age, 20, at age 20 for some reason, and I'm now seeing her at age 70, and she hasn't had, she's been on steroids, and she hasn't drank milk all her life. I mean, there, there are certainly circumstances where that can happen. Um, and so these concepts are important to understand, and we will consider, there's even shades within that, but we would consider severe osteoporosis to be less than 3.5 even without fractures or less than 2.5 with fractures. Don't worry about these exact numbers, it's the concepts that matter. So it is also important to understand that the T-score was validated and is used for patients who are 40 or above, and who are postmenopausal in the, sake, in the case of women. So the T-score is not actually used in premenopausal women, men under the age of 50, or children. There's something called the Z-score, which is exactly similar to what I just showed you, but which is grounded and compared to a group of patients that are more comparable. So those T-scores that I showed you before are based essentially on massive studies looking at postmenopausal women um, and that's what the basic T-score is compared to. So again, in men, less than 50, premenopausal women and children, um, it should not be called the T-score. And by the same token, the term osteopenia and osteoporosis, these are terms we can't actually use if you are less than 50, okay? okay? Um, we cannot use, I'm sorry, less than, um, men less than 50 and um, premenopausal women, we do not use the terms osteoporosis or osteopenia, we simply use low bone mass. This happens a lot when I see young people in their 20s or 30s who, for some reason, have been on steroids and have gotten a bone density measurement, and the bone density measurement is low, and I get, see, I get called to see these patients for, quote, osteoporosis. I can't actually say they have osteoporosis, I can say they have low bone mass. I know it's nomenclature, but it's important because the studies do not do not validate uh, in that those patient populations. We still need to make clinical decisions, and we do, but just to understand the nomenclature. So in the setting of PSC, when should bone density tests be done? Um, according to the American College of Gastroenterology and Society for Liver Disease, really at the time of diagnosis of PSC, there should be a baseline bone density test obtained to have numbers to follow to establish what, how strong the bone is. And then how often really is on a case-by-case -case basis. Typically, we measure bone, uh, re-measure bone densities every two years, but under certain circumstances, we may measure it more frequently. The most frequent we would do would probably be a year. Bone is a slow tissue to change. It's not gonna, it, this is never something we would do every six months, for example. But in situations, for example, where patients are on high-dose steroids, which are known to accelerate bone loss, we might uh, consider getting a repeat at one year. Certainly, if there's a history of fragility fracture, again, falling and breaking something, that should be an indication to get a bone density test. Before liver transplantation, we typically get a bone density test. In the presence of cirrhosis, if it has not already been done, that is a marker for the factors that contribute to um, to low bone metabolism and should be done. And certainly steroid use for more than three months. And when we talk about steroid use, the cutoff that's most accepted is prednisone at a dose of 7.5 milligram or more per day for more than three months. If you are on that dose of prednisone, then that increases your risk. That is a very clear risk factor for osteoporosis. If you've just had a few dose packs here and there, you know, two, three a year, no big deal. Um, even if you had a big dose of prednisone for, say, a month, and then it was successfully tapered off, that's fine. But if there is continuous use of prednisone, then that absolutely increases the risk of osteoporosis. Um, we routinely see patients pre-transplant for all transplants, heart, liver, lung, and this is what we do. We measure a bone density test at baseline, and we take a careful history. And if there is any concern about steroids being used, which they are always used after transplant, we may or may not recommend medication, which I'll touch upon briefly. But we certainly go over calcium and vitamin D, which is what I'm going to be talking about briefly, actually at length. So universal recommendations for um, maintaining bone health. Number one, calcium and vitamin D, which I will talk about in a little bit. 
Uh, the, a lot of these speak for themselves. No smoking, which is a risk factor. Obviously, limit alcohol, fall prevention. Weight-bearing exercise and balance training. If you have neuropathy, that is a risk factor for falls, okay? Patients who have neuropathy from diabetes or otherwise, who have chronic numbness or tingling in their feet, who can't quite feel their feet, um, that is, again, a risk factor. Um, if you're not sure, you can do a simple exercise. You stand in front of a corner in your house so you can hold onto the walls, and you stand on one foot. You see how long you can stand on one foot without falling, and you can catch yourself on the wall. You should be able to stay really for a minute or so on each foot. If you can't, it's time to start working on your balance, okay, and to think about possible neuropathy. And um, home modifications essentially is simple things like making sure areas are well lit, you have no slip rugs, you're not wearing slippers that will fall off. Yearly height measurement, very important. If you have not had your height measured, get your height measured because. There we go. I lost it in again, but this is imperfect, but this is something that tells us that is a clue to compression of vertebrae leading to, uh, to osteoporosis. Again, many other things can contribute to height loss, um, such as stooping forward, arthritis, and so forth. But um, if you recall, if your height has dropped for more than more than one and a half inch from your height that you remember as a young adult, you are at risk for osteoporosis and you should be getting checked out. You should be getting, considering very strongly getting a bone density test. Um, we rarely have good actual measurements, but uh, again, most people do remember how, high, how tall they were at their, at their, in their young adulthood. What is the recommended daily calcium intake? For young adults, 1,300 milligram. For adult men and women, between 1,000 and 1,200 milligram per day. What does this mean? It's I'll go over uh, sources of it. It's important to understand that daily calcium intake is decreased with intestinal diseases, such as inflammatory bowel disease, post-bariatric surgeries such as the Ruan Y. And if you are taking stomach antacids, you are not absorbing calcium properly because the typical calcium, calcium carbonate, needs to be broken down by acid in order to be absorbed. So what you need to be taking is calcium citrate. I will go over that. The best calcium is dietary calcium, calcium that is coming from food. Okay, this guy is getting good calcium. Notice what this cow is doing, eating greens all day. That is one option for getting calcium into your body. The other option is, is dairy products. And I will go over dairy products briefly here with you. Um, recognizing that a lot of people can't tolerate dairy products. So this is what you would need to do in order to get enough calcium in your diet on a daily basis. On a daily basis, you should get four dairy servings per day in order to meet that 1,000 to 1,200 milligram per day. What does this mean? This means an eight ounce glass of milk. Eight ounces, that little bittiest of those white styrofoam cups, okay? One of those of milk per day, I'm sorry, four per milk per day or any one of these others. You could also do calcium fortified orange juice. That's an option, same amount. Any individual serving of yogurt, that will do it. That's your 300 milligram roughly. Uh, two ounces of cheese. These are four cubes of cheese the size of dice. Um, or a quarter cup of grated cheese. All of those represent uh, 300 milligram approximately. And if you get four of those in per day, no matter what the combination, you have got your daily calcium intake. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people cannot take dairy. And I recognize that there are concerns about dairy possibly being pro-inflammatory. Um, and that is very much a concern. You can certainly do low-fat yogurt. That would be one option. Low-fat milk is another option. Where else? You can look at greens. Remember, I showed you the picture of the cow chewing greens. Yes, you can get calcium by eating greens, but you're going to have to be eating like a cow, meaning half your plate of greens every single meal, pretty much. Um, who knew dried figs had so much calcium? Um, broccoli, there's a lot, there's, cal there's calcium in broccoli, but again, you're going to have to be eating a lot of broccoli to be getting that 1,200, uh, 1,000 to 1,200 milligram per day of calcium. So if, um, if calcium in your diet is just not realistic, then calcium supplements are the way to go. And what I typically tell patients and what I do myself is I take a calcium, one calcium supplement in the morning with breakfast. Calcium is better absorbed with food. 
And then the rest of the day, I work to get at least two of those dairy servings in. And that's reasonable. Okay. Or if you're brave, you could say, no calcium in the morning. I'm going to try to get those four servings in today. And if I can't, then I will catch up later in the evening. The problem is calcium, you can only absorb so much calcium at a time you're, you're in, in terms of supplements. Supplements are typically 500 to 600 milligrams. And if you take two supplements at once, you're still only going to absorb the value of one. So you've got to kind of spread those out in time. Typical, the typical cheap calcium is calcium carbonate. Um, but that is the one that doesn't get absorbed if you're taking an antacid, and it also doesn't get absorbed as well if you have GI disease, malabsorption, gut issues. And so the typical one that I recommend for people who have malabsorption or gut issues is calcium citrate. And it's very important to read the label because even though the numbers are big on the label in terms of 950 or 1500 milligrams, you have to read the actual label to see how much elemental calcium is in there. Because sometimes even the ones that say 1200 milligram on the front of the bottle, if you read the fine print, it's actually only 200 milligrams of elemental calcium. So make sure you read the label to be getting the ones that have the higher amount of elemental calcium. And um, maximum would be 2500 milligram per day. And these slides will be available. Now, after all that hard work getting calcium in, don't pee it out because this is what you're going to do to pee it out. One cup of coffee, you lose 70 milligram of that hard-earned calcium. A, a regular can of pop, 30 milligram. That's also tea. Tea is about half of coffee. Watch out for the caffeine-containing energy drinks. Look at that amount of calcium that you are losing. Um, all right, so be careful how much... of the caffeine that you are getting in your system. Watch out for the caffeine. Vitamin D. Vitamin D is needed to help absorb calcium. What happens if you live north of the 37th north latitude, you are not getting enough calcium, enough vitamin D. Where are we? Well north of, the, of that latitude. And if you are using sunscreen, you are not absorbing calcium. A sunscreen with an SPF of 8 will decrease your vitamin D production by 95%. And the news only gets better because if you have old skin, that is the equivalent of SPF of 30. <laughs> All right? So we are doomed. <laughs> so what this means is you will probably need to take vitamin D supplements. And I can tell you that 90% plus of patients here in Northeast Ohio whose vitamin D I check year-round is low. And mine was low. And I take a 2,000 units vitamin D supplement. I'm going to talk to you about that. Um, vitamin D uh, metabolism is a complex affair, but guess what's in the middle of all this? The liver. So if your liver is not working well, you're going to have trouble with metabolism associated with vitamin D. And if you look at all these factors associated with vitamin D deficiency, here are the usual culprits coming up again. Um, so vitamin D deficiency, the number that's measured in the blood, if it's less than 20, you've got some trouble. You need to get some vitamin D supplements. And there really is no way of actually telling how low you are except by measuring it in the blood. So the goal is you want to get a vitamin D in the blood of 30 or more. And when we say vitamin D, we're specifically talking about vitamin D3, also known as 25-hydroxy vitamin D. That is the one that is measured in the blood. And how can you do that? Typically, most people need 1,000 to 2,000 units of D3, which is the regular little yellow gel capsules that you can buy at the drugstore. I would say most people need 2,000. In the winter, I pop it up to 4,000 personally. Um, and often, there is a higher level that is needed. And there's a different formulation called ergocalciferol, which is prescription only, which can be given, up, I know it sounds crazy, 50,000 units a week, but the body only absorbs a small amount. My vitamin D was 19. I had to take 100,000 units of ergocalciferol for two months to bring that back up. Okay, so it is extremely common. And here I was thinking that I was healthy. <laughs> okay, now watch out though, because too much vitamin D, guess what? Can cause kidney stones and pruritus. Okay, so here we are navigating the dangerous shoals here. And really what this means is that you should get your vitamin D level checked, okay? Especially in the dead of winter. Please get your vitamin D level checked. If it's not good at the end of August, you're in trouble for the rest of the, for the, rest of the year. You will need supplements. Okay. Just briefly now talking about um, 
kind of the dance that occurs in, in bone metabolism. Bone metabolism is really a balance between the cells on the right that make bone, that lay down bone, which are known as the osteoblasts, and the cells on the left that chew up bone, the osteoclasts. And different osteoporosis medications will act on different parts of this, uh, this loop. The most, and there are many, many osteoporosis medications out there. The vast majority of them are in the setting of postmenopausal osteoporosis. Have there been any studies done on uh, osteoporosis medications in PSC? The short answer is no. There's been one study done on PBC in, with use of alendronate or Fosamax, which is the standard uh, bisphosphonate used for treatment of osteoporosis, which did show benefit. And so we extrapolate that it is likely to be helpful. Um, but all the ones that end in NATE there in the middle, all these are the bisphosphonates, which are the standard of care medication um, for osteoporosis, which are pills typically taken once a week, um, but sometimes also given IV. And um, you'll notice that the, there is one called zoledronic acid or zoledronate, otherwise known as reclast. That is an IV form of bisphosphonate. That is often something we use in patients in whom we are concerned about absorption issues. And one of the problems with bisphosphonates, they can work very well, um, but one of the problem is absorption. Um, these medications are medications that have to be in your stomach for a certain period of time to be absorbed, which I'll get back to in a sec. So the bisphosphonates, um, all those ones that I mentioned earlier uh, in the middle there, are the standard first-line treatment for osteoporosis. These are what we give to patients, for example, who are going to be getting high-dose steroids uh, post-transplant. That is our go-to medication, uh, standard of care, the ones closer to the bottom. Uh, these are newer ones, which I won't discuss today, but I can certainly answer questions. So the bisphosphonates um, are really fairly inert medications that bind to the calcium of hydroxyapatite in bones, teeth, and soft tissue. They've been used a very long time. And that photomicrograph, the two black lines actually show um, radio-labeled bisphosphonate that has actually absorbed into the bone, and that's what it does. It actually gets incorporated into the bone and helps to maintain the bony structure. And once it's absorbed, bisphosphonates stay there for years. They just penetrate within the bone and stay there and act as a reservoir. Um, they, in the world of postmenopausal osteoporosis, it's been very clearly shown that they increase bone density by three to five percent, which is pretty darn good, because remember how much I said that you lose. You lose like in the, in the range of one and a half to two percent. So if you can increase the bone density by uh, three to five percent, that's excellent. Um, and they have been demonstrated to decrease vertebral fractures over uh, with, pro, with uh, continued use. Um, they have a demonstrated benefit in primary biliary cirrhosis, but they have not been used in PSC, but we assume that they are also helpful in this setting. And as I said, they're routinely used post-transplant. I alluded to the issues with absorption. These are medications that, if there is poor renal function, cannot be used. So if there is or poor kidneys, these medications cannot be used. They need to be taken on an empty stomach with a big glass of water, nothing else for half an hour in order to be absorbed. And they cannot be taken if there is any concern about esophageal problems, in particular esophageal varices. So if there are esophageal varices, the pill form of these medications is contraindicated. Um, and if there are any concerns about absorption in general of the gut, the pill form likewise is contraindicated, which is why we often will go with the uh, IV form. The IV form is a very simple 15-minute infusion once a year. Isn't that nice? Um, and that is generally very well tolerated. Um, very few side effects with bisphosphonates. Um, I can talk about those later, but I see Dr. Kerry coming down the stairs, so I am going to start, the music is playing, I think. I'm going to start wrapping up. And just um, some reminders again, get that calcium in. If you can't do it through food, get some supplements, but aim for calcium citrate and go for the higher doses, like the 500 milligram elemental. Get your vitamin D checked. Um, and uh, don't forget to do some weight-bearing exercises. Aim for the, the proverbial 10,000 steps. That helps with the bones. Thank you very much.